Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today's saint, Saint Augustine, was born in 354 AD. And though he was born to a mother who was Christian, he himself was not baptized as a child and grew up influenced by his mother, but not convinced thoroughly by her to become a Christian, a Catholic himself. He strayed far from the right path for the first 33 years of his life, and only in 387, after many errors of the intellect and of the will, did he finally receive baptism at the hands of St. Ambrose in Milan, and thanks to the prayers, the constant prayers of his mother, St. Monica, for him. After his conversion and baptism, he went back to northern Africa, where he was born. He went back there from Milan, where he had been studying, and there led a life of prayer and solitude. He received ordination to the priesthood and was then elected the bishop of Hippo, where he remained for the next 34 years of his life, from 396 till his death in 430 AD. And while St. Augustine was one of, uh, certainly one of, the most influential persons in the whole history of the church, this bishop and doctor of the church, by his example of holiness and by his writings, was one of the most influential persons in the history of the church. One of, if not the most influential person in his own life was his mother, Monica. And intentionally, I'd like to uh, link these two uh, saints together in this little reflection and basically uh, repeat yesterday's reflection today uh, because of this close link between these two saints and to underscore an important point that, again, while Augustine, this, this doctor of the church, was... His incalcul he has incalculable influence for the church even today. In his own life, the most influential person was his mother, and he owed much, if not in a certain sense everything, in quotes, to her, to her tireless intercession for him. And this leads us to, to, to the point that despite, I guess, you know, this um, this. Uh, this demand, I would say, this, this uh, unceasing demand for women to be more recognized and given more power and more authority in the church, we forget the fact that women have been, by God, already given much power and authority and influence in the church and in society and in the world. They have a different type of power and authority than men do because, though they are equal, they are not the same, but nonetheless, they have a, a very great power. They have the power to, to influence and, and to form and, and to shape you know, the, the children whose mothers they are, the, the husbands whose wives they are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can encapsulate this by saying that though men have been given by God this position, in, again, in, in, in society and in the world and, and in every society, in the family and in the church, this role of commanding, being able to tell other people what to do and in a certain way force them to do that, to carry out that command. They have that real authority to do so. They are heads of society and the head can command. Women have a different role. Women have a more influential role. Women can actually make others want to do a specific thing. While men can make others do it, women can make others want to do it. And there's a big difference there. And although it takes more patience and more effort to, to, to gently influence and to make somebody want to do something, that is a far more effective way of commanding. And that's, in fact, the way Our Lady commands us by exercising this gentle compulsion on our hearts.
And that's why our Lord, opening this little parenthetical note, wants to rule in a special way through Our Lady. In his kingship, he wants to associate Our Lady because he doesn't want to rule us by force, by violence, by bending our will, but rather by influencing our will through his mother so that we want to love him back, so that we want to serve him. And again, it's women who have this particular grace to be able to, to do that. If they realize what their calling is, and if they have the patience and the virtue to exercise it. Again, it's, it's easy and it's tempting just to want to command and force others to, to do something, but it's far more effective to patiently influence them and want, make them want to do it. So... Recapping at this point, we can say that, yes, men are the heads of society, the heads of the church, but women are the hearts, as Pius XI says it. Men are the heads, women are the hearts. And we, uh, kind of concluding this little reflection, I think we must, um, yes, recognize this and kind of, you know, break free from this kind of, you know, this... Uh, this, uh, this kind of socialist you know, view of, of the church as a struggle between men and women for power. It's, it's not a struggle. It's just a diversity of charisms, diversity of missions, diversity of vocations. And one cannot replace the other. And it's precisely the, the fact that one is replacing the other, one is, so to speak, taking the place of the other, that we have chaos in the church. Now, the church today is, is being run by effeminate men, and masculinized, masculinized women, and that's the problem. Effeminate men and masculinized women are running the show and causing great chaos in the church. Whereas men need to realize that, yes, they are men and they are created in a certain way by God. They need to be men, fathers, leaders, shepherds, heroes. And women need to be women, mothers, influencers, formers, shapers of the hearts of these men. And that's, I think, the, the order that we need to kind of aim for in the, in the church and, then, and in society. And the relationship between Monica and, and Augustine, these two saints, gives us an example of, of precisely that. And it's, it's a grace that we can ask for of St. Augustine today and of his mother, St. Monica, and, um, and we can be sure, we can be sure that through the intercession of, of both of these saints, we too will be helped in, in our vocations in life to fulfill our mission in the church and, in, and in, in society and in the world as well. Praised be Jesus and Mary.